All right, hypertension. This is one of the areas that I I like a lot um, as far as like the treatment algorithms and things like that. So this is a section that we will definitely be talking a little bit more evidence-based medicine, if you will. Uh, I'm going to walk through some of the clinical trials that are behind like the recommendations and things like that. So I'll tell you what I want you guys to kind of be aware of um, and tell you guys what what I want you to know. I don't expect you to memorize all the names of trials and things like that at this point in your career, but I'll make sure that we're on the same page as we go and mark things that I want you to kind of pay attention to. Some of it I do want you to know, but it won't be like all the different names and everything. So starting with just with some kind of some background, um, arterial blood pressure is basically just the pressure in the arterial wall, and they measure it in middle, millimeters of mercury, so mmHg. Um, and the two kind of like identified arterial blood pressure values that we focus on are the systolic and diastolic. So systolic obviously is that top number that's usually larger, hopefully, and diastolic is the uh, bottom number in the blood pressure reading. Um, so systolic is going to represent kind of like the peak value, if you will, and that's really during the time of like cardiac contraction. Um, and then diastolic is your... Uh, period of time where your cardiac chambers are kind of filling um, and it's after that contraction. And then so during the actual cardiac cycle, um, so a heartbeat, you have two thirds of the time spent in diastole and one third uh, in systole. And we will talk about that a little bit more too when we get back or when we get around to heart failure because that'll play into a role about how we evaluate ejection fraction and all those things. So arterial blood pressure is going to be hemodynamically um, generated between this interplay, for lack of a better word, um, between blood flow and resistance to blood flow. So the easiest way I think about it is looking at the equation, um, which is blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So cardiac output is um, heart rate times stroke volume is what makes up cardiac output. So Heart rate, obviously, how, how quickly your heart is beating, how many times your heart is beating in a minute, and then stroke volume is how much blood your, uh, your heart is able to pump out um, with each beat, so out of the ventricles um, with each beat. And so that combination uh, or that product, if you will, from, when you multiply cardiac output times stroke volume, you get cardiac out or heart rate times stroke volume, you, you get cardiac output. Total peripheral resistance is, you know, dealing with obviously the um, resistance to that blood flow. And so those kind of things go hand in hand. And if we mess one or increase one, then we're most likely going to raise blood pressure unless the other side of that is coming down um, kind of at the same time. So when we look at our medication regimens, it'll make a little bit more sense as far as which side of that equation we're targeting. So um, under normal physiologic, well, what we consider normal physiological conditions, um, blood pressure is going to kind of fluctuate throughout the day and it follows your circadian rhythm. And originally we kind of assumed that everyone followed this same path where your blood pressure decreases to its lowest volume or lowest value while you're sleeping. And then as you know, you start to wake up, you're your blood pressure has like kind of like this sharp rise and it's the highest, um, you know, upon awakening and kind of throughout the, the mid morning. And so what we call those patients are dippers. So they dip in, in, in the evening and night while they're sleeping. And then it comes back up in the morning. And that was considered like kind of everyone's normal circadian rhythm. What we found as kind of like time went on and we started doing more research, we actually realized that a huge majority of the population is actually what we call non-dippers. So they actually have it have that backwards where their blood pressure actually goes up at night while they're sleeping and it's it comes back down again when they wake up in the morning. And so that really threw off kind of how we timed the medications uh, as far as the patients who were non-dippers. And really the only way to kind of establish whether somebody is a dipper or non-dipper is to have like, you know, 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring on that person. It kind of monitors their blood pressure throughout the day. Uh, other than that, we have to kind of target our medication, the timing of our medications, um, based on if, and the fact that we don't know whether the person's a dipper or a non-dipper. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but um, that if you hear me referring to dippers and non-dippers, that's what I'm referring to is that whether they follow that normal circadian rhythm or they do not. So 
Other times when blood pressure is kind of like acutely increased is usually during like physical activity um, or emotional stress. So if you have a patient that comes into the clinic and, you know, they've had something going on in their family or they've, you know, had a lot of stress at work or something like that, their blood pressure may be elevated. Uh, and it's not necessarily that they have true sustained hypertension, but just that that stress that's going on in their life, you know, those cortisol levels go up, um, it releases all your other sort of like catecholamines and your norepinephrine and things like that. And then it makes your blood pressure end up going up. So, um, again, we'll kind of talk about that as we go through the treatment options. So one of the biggest kind of systems to think about when we deal with blood pressure is the RAS system or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And this is sort of a, like a complex system that is involved with regulating your actual blood pressure and several different components of it regulate that blood pressure. So it's primarily activated and regulated through the kidney. And so it starts off with uh, something called renin, and that's an enzyme that is stored in the juxtaglomerular cells, um, which are in the afferent arterial of the kidney or the nephron. Um, and what that renin does is it basically, it gets activated when there are certain situations happening, whether it's you're, you're having an issue with your renal perfusion, um, whether you're getting a release of these catecholamines, so like norepinephrine or serotonin or something like that. Um, and it could be a something not even in the kidney necessarily where you're getting an increased um, intake of sodium and chloride. Um, so if someone has a lot of salt in their diet, um, potassium can throw it off. Um, basically, when, there's, when it senses that there's an imbalance, this renin is released, and that renin is an enzyme that catalyzes the first step of the RAS system, which is converting angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Um, and that happens in the blood. And then angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 by an enzyme called ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme. And that a ACE is going to be like a major uh, sort of target for our, one of our main blood pressure treating groups. So that angiotensin, that's kind of like that next step in that algorithm or, or process, um, uh, elevates your blood pressure through various mechanisms. Um, so it can cause like direct vasoconstriction. Um, it can stimulate more catecholamine release if that's what's needed. Um, uh, and basically again, this, this system is designed to where if you're not getting enough perfusion, you know, in, in, for, in your kidneys recognize that you're not getting enough blood flow. This is designed to kind of raise your blood pressure. And so it's, there is a safety mechanism. The problem is when this system kind of goes haywire and you have a dysregulation of the system, it ends up pushing your blood pressure too high and keeping it too high. So this, this, this whole system is there to, for, to keep your blood pressure stable and to increase it if needed. Um, but that's what's kind of one of the leading factors of blood pressure um, or hypertension, I should say, is this system kind of going out of whack. Um, so after angiotensin II does its thing, the other piece of that is it stimulates um, something called aldosterone synthesis, which is released from the adrenal cortex. And aldosterone, uh, its main function is to kind of reabsorb sodium and water, um, which then eventually increases plasma volume and increases total peripheral resistance, and then that ultimately leads to increases in blood pressure. Um, and aldosterone is kind of another target that we really look for in multiple cardiovascular diseases. So things like heart failure, um, pa patients that are post MI, patients with kidney disease, um, and we want to kind of inhibit aldosterone in a lot of cases because that will kind of promote this tissue remodeling, um, you know, which can uh, or it block tissue remodeling, I should say, um, because that tissue remodeling that happens when you get this overproduction of aldosterone can lead to myocardial fibrosis and eventually like vascular dysfunction. So, again, this system, when it works well, is, is great and it's there to keep you healthy. However, when it is not working appropriately uh, is when we start getting this increase in blood pressure over time that ends up being a chronic condition. Um, and the reason why I kind of went through all that is not so much that I want you to memorize the steps of the RAS system. One, I want you to be familiar with what the RAS system is just in general because we throw that term around a lot. And two, when we're going through the different treatment options, we're targeting different uh, parts of that RAS system. And so I kind of want you to be familiar with that just 
from a from a mechanism standpoint of the drugs we're going to talk about. So this is just kind of a bigger picture to show what's going on. Uh, so whatever the case may be, whatever activates um, renin production, so whether that's uh, an increase in sympathetic stimulation or a decrease in arterial uh, pressure or blood flow or perfusion, um, that renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, and then that ACE or that angiotensin converting enzyme is what's going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And then that angiotensin 2 is kind of what has multiple um, mechanisms at play where it affects vascular smooth muscle, the heart, uh, things like that, as well as increasing aldosterone, um, which then has a whole other um, kind of path that it follows, which ends up increasing blood pressure more. So they're all kind of linked and they're all different targets that we can look for. Any questions about the RAS system at this point? Okay. Um, so as far as things that can kind of increase cardiac output, so one mechanism is an increase in cardiac preload. So that usually comes about from having an increased uh, fluid volume, and that's mostly from a patient having excessive sodium intake um, or if they are not excreting sodium properly in the renal um, pathway, the nephron, and you're getting a, a reuptake of that sodium, then uh, you, your serum sodium goes up and that ends up leading to um, fluid uh, retention and increased fluid volume, which then leads to increased cardiac preload. Um, venous constriction can happen from excessive stimulation of that RAS pathway, as well as like sympathetic nervous system. So your fight or flight, um, overactivity. So all those kind of things. Cause again, if you're, if you're in a fight or flight situation, your heart rate's going up, heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes up. Um, and so all these things can kind of increase cardiac output. And then on the other side with, uh, increased peripheral resistance or that increase in total peripheral resistance, um, can be from multiple things as well. So from the RAS system, um, it can be from, again, that sympathetic nervous system uh, overactivity. Sometimes it can be a genetic alteration in the actual cell membrane. So whether it's like calcium channels or things like that, um, there can be things like hyperinsulinemia. So you're getting, um, a patient that is overweight, their, inc their glucose consumption is really high. So they're getting this chronic, in, um, excreting of, of insulin from their pancreas, ultimately leading to diabetes in most cases. Um, but that also can increase your, your peripheral resistance over time. And so that kind of, that's why blood pressure and diabetes usually kind of go hand in hand. Um, but there's multiple factors kind of at play. So we have multiple targets that we can go after um, when we're looking at treatment options. All right. Um, some more kind of background information uh, that's important and something that I, this is going to be a term that we definitely talk about a lot. But ASCVD or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease Um Hypertension in general. So one of the big things that patients will ask is, you know, why do I need to take this medicine? I don't feel bad when my blood pressure is high, which, you know, some patients will talk about headaches and things like that when their blood pressure is high. But a lot of times they don't, they're asymptomatic. At least they think they are. And the other part of that is some patients, when they start therapy and their blood pressure kind of is lowered for the first time, they end up feeling worse than they did originally because your body sort of is readjusted to thinking that that high blood pressure is, is your normal. And so when you drop your blood pressure to what technically is normal, um, you end up getting like orthostasis and feelings of like headaches and you know other, you know, dizziness and things like that. And so the one big thing that's important to kind of show patients is it's not so much that right now and, and, you know, acutely that it's a problem, but it's the increased risk over time that hypertension kind of, um, you know, that increased risk that hypertension causes. So that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, you know, which ends up leading to or can can comprise of myocardial infarction, stroke, all those things that we don't want to see, um, all kind of make up atherosclerotic disease. And your increased risk go, or your risk goes up pretty um, pretty quickly when your hypertension becomes more and more uncontrolled. 
Um, Kim's saying we had a patient pass out in our office after starting her BP meds because she was so high. Yeah. So that's another thing is bringing their blood pressure down, you know, slowly, not just giving them, uh, hitting them with the kitchen sink, if you will, um, with blood pressure lowering agents. But we'll talk about that when we get to it for sure. Especially it depends on what agents we're actually using too. But, um, one thing that can is important to kind of be aware of is the the risk calculator. So they have the ASCVD ten year risk um, assessment tool. Um, this was something that was put out by the American Car- um, College of Cardiology, and their newest app, the newest version of it, is the ASCVD Plus app. You can either get to it from their website, which I have the link there, um, or you can just download it off of like iTunes or the Apple. Uh, app store or whatever or i think google play has it on theirs as well but it's um, basically just an app and you can input the data which i'll show you in the next slide and that'll show you what the patient's 10-year risk of having some sort of a cardiovascular event um, will be based on whatever their current situation is so this is the app right here and so you would basically just fill out this information um, so their, their age, sex, race, um, what their current systolic and diastolic blood pressure um, readings are, what their lipid panel looks like, whether or not they have a history of diabetes, whether or not they're a smoker, whether or not they're on hypertensive treatment, or whether they're on a statin, and whether they're on aspirin therapy um, are all questions to fill out, and that'll give you a, um, a 10-year risk uh, assessment. Now, the one that I wouldn't be surprised if it changes soon. Is going to be the aspirin. Um, we've had some new data that came out last year showing that aspirin for actually preventing a cardiovascular event is not nearly as good as we thought it was for a long time. Uh, and so they may be taking this part out, so don't be surprised about that. But for now, they've it's still in there. All right. Um, and we'll come back to that, uh, Like, is why we need to have that app um, in a second when we actually talk about who we're treating and who we're not treating. Um, but just to kind of go over some of like the the guidelines and the goals as far as your your actual blood pressure reading, what your goal blood pressure will be, I'm going to show you a couple different guidelines. So the JNC8, um, and this is just FYI, this is not the one that I go off of. Uh, if it comes down to like pants testing and things like that, I think it's important to kind of know both. Um, I was under the impression that the pants exam was kind of getting away from JNC8 because there's a whole separate guideline now that's widely accepted. Um, but the, uh, basically the JNC8 was a, uh, hang on, let me shut my door. My dogs are barking. Sorry about that. Um, so the JNC-8 uh, was like a follow-up to JNC-7, obviously, which JNC-7 was like a true guideline where they, they had all this uh, data backing it, a whole panel of um, experts that had compiled this information. The JNC-8 was actually a group of 14 um, experts, if you will, and they kind of came together. It actually originally wasn't supposed to be a true guideline. Um, it was set up to be kind of like an expert opinion. It wasn't set up to be a guideline with the way they kind of compiled the information. And so what got confusing too is there was eight uh, members of that expert panel that voted for the GNC-8 guidelines to be published and six that voted against it. So only one person made the you know difference between them having a tie. And you know so they have a minority report um, written from the six that voted against it, and they kind of explain why they disagree with the guidelines and why it may not be accurate and this, that, and the other. Um, so, you know, as far as those guidelines go, um, I'll show you why I like the newer guidelines better. Um, but for a long time, these guidelines were kind of based on some data that looked like there wasn't a whole lot of benefit with like lowering blood pressure back to what we would consider like normal standards versus more relaxed blood pressure measuring. Um, if we didn't see a benefit, then why push the blood pressure lower? Um, but now there's some data that kind of shows the opposite of that. So that's what GNC eight is right here. So for most people it's 140 over 90. Um, and then most, uh, if you have patients 60 or over their blood pressure goal is going to be less than 150 over 90. Um, but that's kind of what they, they say. 
and this is just a example of several other guidelines that have come out over the years. So they had the 2014 hypertension guidelines. They had the um, Cadigo guidelines, if you see down here, um, which was the kidney folks. Um, the ADA is the American Diabetes Association. So they had their guidelines. Um, the NICE 2011, that was the European guidelines. And so there's multiple guidelines, that, have, and they all kind of echo that 140 over 90 for the most part. Um, but again, if you look at the dates, these are all pretty outdated at this point. So 2017 came around and all the major cardiovascular groups, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, um, and all these others that I'm not going to name, um, basically came together and wrote a new guideline um, based on the newest evidence that was available. And they're ultimately like what they came to their conclusion of for adults with confirmed hypertension, especially those with a known CVD risk um, or 10 year ASCVD risk of 10% or higher, that a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 is what they recommended. And so when you see this on the side panel here where it says um, level, LOE, it's a level of evidence, um, and the recommendation rating over here where it's under COR, um, that's like the like how well the data kind of backs that up. So for the patients that have a 10-year ASCVD risk of 10% or higher, um, the data is pretty clear that all patients are going to like benefit from, from going uh, to a blood pressure target of less than 130 over 80. For adults with confirmed hypertension that don't have any other additional markers or increased risk of having an event, um, they still recommend a blood pressure uh, of less than 130 over 80, but it's not as much evidence backing that up as it is the patients that are a little bit sicker with higher risk. But they do still recommend that if a patient can get down that low without any kind of like adverse effects and things like that. So the big study that came out that kind of like justified these uh, these guide these new guidelines being written was the study called the Sprint trial, um, and basically what they were looking at was were patients that did not have diabetes um, and did not have a history of stroke, but did have a high um, uh, CV risk. And they had two different groups they were studying. So one group, they had a target blood pressure of less than one third or less than 120. And then the standard target group was 135 to 139. Um, and they were looking for the first occurrence of either MI, um, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, or dying from some sort of a cardiovascular cause. And what they found at the end of the study, and this is just for your information, you don't have to memorize all these numbers. Um, what they found was that for example, cardiovascular mortality was decreased um, in the intensive group. So the chances of dying from some sort of cardiovascular event was statistically um, decreased when you push that blood pressure lower. And the number needed to treat, which means if you treat this many patients, you prevent one more cardiovascular death, uh, was 167. So that doesn't that sounds like a high number, but if you think about like the number of people that we actually treat for hypertension in this country, you know, every 167 that we kind of push lower towards those new guideline goals, um, we decrease the death by one. Um, same with all cause mortality, um, the number needed to treat was only 83, and so and there's a whole bunch of other results that were were listed this i think this the study was several pages long that you could read through so i won't go through all that but basically they justified that this these lower um, blood pressure targets um, did provide benefit now as far as the target systolic blood pressure in the intensive group was being being less than 120 the reason why the guidelines kind of say less than 130 over 80 is because they did start seeing adverse effects when you pushed all the way to 120. Uh, and so they kind of felt like this was a good balance of, you know, less than 130. You're not going all the way down to 120, so you still got some wiggle room there. And you can eliminate some of those adverse effects and still get the benefit of the lower blood pressure goal. Um, any questions about that information, I promise I'll get to the actual pharmacology stuff in a second. All right, and no questions. All right, so this is the table from the 2017 guidelines and how they kind of classify 
uh, hypertension. So in order to be considered to have normal blood pressure, you have to have a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 as well as a diastolic less than 80. So both of those numbers have to be less than those targets in order to be considered normal blood pressure. Elevated blood pressure has to be 120 to 129 systolic, and you still have to have a diastolic less than 80. So if you have a patient that comes in and their blood pressure is, you know, 128 over 72, then that would be considered elevated um, blood pressure. Now, a patient that is considered to have hypertension, and these these used to be a lot less strict, but um, stage one hypertension is now considered to be systolic 130 to 139 or a diastolic of 80 to 89. So notice how like the and and ors kind of switch there. So if a patient comes in and their blood pressure is 128 on systolic, but their diastolic is 85, technically speaking, that is hypertension because their diastolic is is in that 80 to 89 range, hypertension stage one. Um, Stage two is anything systolic over 140 or anything diastolic over 90. So by this, like these categories, a lot more people... Um, would be classified as having hypertension now. And so, you know, that's something that kind of caused a little bit of controversy because some people were like, oh, well, now just everybody is going to be on therapy. And there was some talk that it was like, oh, it was big pharma kind of pushing these guidelines. Um, One, the data does kind of back this up. And two, all the drugs that they recommend in the guidelines are all generic. So really big pharma is not reaping any benefit from these these guidelines. Um, The drugs that are being recommended are all pennies on the dollar um, to produce, and so they're not making a ton of money um, off any of these. So again, still a little bit of controversy, and not everyone follows um, the 130 over 80 guidelines. I know at my clinic, we kind of, the the government guidelines that they, that they re- require us to follow are less than 140 over 90 still, and they've never changed them. However, we still try to pol- like push the patients to 130 over 80 um, in most cases if possible. But this is the categories and the, the kind of the staging. So things like prehypertension, all that are no longer used as terminology. All right. So this is kind of like the treatment algorithm to kind of figure out whether or not you're going to start therapy. So this is all initiation of therapy here. So if the patient has normal blood pressure, so you get a patient and their blood pressure is 115 over 72, whatever. Um, obviously always want to promote optimal lifestyle habits because if that patient's 22, um, when they're 30 and they're eating the same as they were, did when they were 22, it may not go as well for them. So Obviously, always promoting good lifestyle, healthy habits, exercise, diet, and things like that. And then just kind of reassessing in a year to make sure that they don't develop hypertension. If you have a patient that is considered to be uh, elevated blood pressure, um, then again, promoting lifestyle modifications, diet and exercise, um, and then reassessing in three to six months. But they don't, at that point, recommend uh, pharmacotherapy treatment. So you don't necessarily have to put them on medication. Um, when you have stage one hypertension, that's when you kind of have to assess whether or not, you know, you're going to start uh, therapy or not. So that's where the 10 year risk kind of comes into play. So if the patient has had some sort of a cardiovascular event, so they have a history of ASCVD, so a, a heart attack, stroke, something like that, um, most likely they're already going to be on treatment anyway. So that's kind of redundant. But Let's just say they they come to you, they've, they've stopped themselves on all therapy, and they, you're starting from scratch. That's an indication that they probably need to be on medication if their blood pressure is still elevated. If they have diabetes, if they have chronic kidney disease, or if you calculate their 10-year risk and it's greater than 10%, equal to or greater than 10%, then you would be a candidate for potentially starting um, a... Uh, a, a actual medication in that patient. If not, so let's say their their blood pressure is just a little bit high um, that particular day. Maybe they had a coffee or they've been running around or something that day before they actually got to your clinic. They don't have any of these other risk factors. Then you can still encourage them to have lifestyle modifications, but then bring them back in about three to six months to kind of reassess to make sure that blood that blood pressure has gone down. Um, because it also could be 
you know, white coat hypertension, you know, they're nervous to be at the doctor, um, something like that. So, uh, if a patient does have one of those risk factors, um, they've got clinical ASCVD, they have diabetes, chronic kidney disease, um, 10 year risk, uh, is greater than 10%. Then you, of course, you still want to encourage lifestyle modifications, but you also want to consider medication use at that point as well. And so when it says no compelling indication, we'll talk about like who gets what as far as the first line options when we get to it. But um, if not, you can pick any of those first line options and we'll talk about those individually in, in just a minute and then kind of reassess how they're doing in that medication within that first month. And then the last one is if a patient has stage two, um, in that case, you typically would want to go ahead and start medication. And in most cases, uh, if, if it is stage two, you want to go ahead and start a two drug combination. Um, especially if they have some sort of other risk factors going on, diabetes, um, chronic kidney disease, the post stroke, anything like that. Um, then you can do pretty well with starting two drug regimen as far as getting their blood pressure controlled fairly quickly. Um, and we'll kind of, again, talk about that when we go through the different treatment options. But this is kind of how it's broken down based on those new um, categories of blood pressure um, rankings, if you will. All right. Any questions about that stuff? Katie's saying, so if the patient has either a diastolic greater than 90 or a systolic greater than 140, they are considered stage two. Um, yes, that, that is correct. So, and again, if you look back at this table, um, the, the ands are important for normal and elevated because they have to have both situations happening. And then ors um, on the hypertension stage one and two because it can be either either or diastolic or systolic can be putting them a lot of times it'll end up being both but um, if it's one or the other it can still push them into that stage two and and again this is sort of just a basic outline this does not mean that every single patient that you talk to that has stage two hypertension that's, you know, brand new, um, you know, diagnosis or whatever is actually going to, um, be on two different medications. You know, right. It's, there's more that goes into it than that. You have to assess the patient's need. Uh, and, and so it's not something that we're going to start in every patient. This is kind of like a general guideline, um, that'll kind of help as you're learning these, this information. So just to kind of briefly touch on the, the lifestyle modifications that you'll hear a lot with uh, or talked about in, in hypertension, um, obviously weight loss is, is always important. So if patients overweight, um, you know, it's going to increase their risk for multiple um, comorbidities, diabetes, um, metabolic disease, all kinds of things, especially in, in hypertension as well. And so that's kind of important to discuss with them. Um, you know, obviously always kind of an awkward conversation, but something that's definitely important to, um, make sure that you're discussing with the patients. The DASH diet, um, is something you'll, you'll hear. That's going to be like a kind of a low sodium, um, diet that's also rich with fruits and vegetables. Um, it's kind of like a low, um, fat dairy, um, products that you're going to be concentrating on, um, reducing your saturated fat and total fat intake. Um, but DASH diet is something that you typically will hear thrown around a lot in hypertension, uh, treatments. Um, reduced salt intake is important. And then also physical activity, super important as well. And that is something that always should be encouraged. Even in a patient that doesn't have, um, hypertension at this point, they come in, their blood pressure is normal. It's always still a good idea for them to engage in physical activity so that their blood pressure stays where it needs to. All right. So we're going to get into some of the actual treatment options. Do you guys have any questions about any of that background information stuff? All right. Um, so I do not expect you to necessarily memorize, um, every single one of these drugs with their doses. Um, we'll talk about a couple of them, um, and I'll point out the ones that, you know, maybe if I want you to know a dose or something that I want you to know. But what I do want you to be aware of is recognizing that if you were to see one of these drugs, that it is an ACE inhibitor. So when you see PRIL uh, at the end of the drug name, typically speaking, that's going to be an ACE inhibitor. The ones that you're going to very commonly see, um, lecinopril is probably the most common. 
Um, and after that would probably be benazapril and enalapril. Uh, those are going to be the three most common. Um, you'll see the other ones every once in a while, but um, like captopril, we don't use a whole lot anymore because a lot of times we have to dose it three times a day and we try to avoid stuff like that. But um, yeah, so those are the, the three that we see the most of. So this is going to be considered a first line option for most patients well, with hypertension. Um, and so if you're using monotherapy, so you're only going to use one drug, uh, there's multiple options that we can use first line. And so this is one that is definitely an option for most patients. Um, it is, however, not as effective in African-American patients. So um, we'll talk about which agent is the most effective as monotherapy in African-Americans, but it is different um, in that um in that group, just be, in the data kind of reflects that. So if you're trying to get the most bang for your buck, if you will, um, the ACE inhibitors is not necessarily your best option um, when you're treating African Americans with one agent by itself. The mechanism of action is that, just like it sounds, that enzyme, um, ACE, that you are converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 is inhibited. So you're stopping that step of the RAS system and ultimately shutting the RAS system down at that point so that you are you know, blocking the effects that angiotensin 2 has as well as blocking that aldosterone secretion as well. So you're, you're kind of blocking multiple avenues that angiotensin 2 plays um, as well as all the ones from aldosterone. The adverse effects uh, that we would typically think about with ACE inhibitors, hypotension, and that kind of goes, that kind of is an adverse effect for any antihypertensive, just because when you're lowering the blood pressure, you could lower it too much and they could have symptoms from that. Um, also, uh, acute kidney injury is something that we worry about, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Hyperkalemia is another condition we have to worry about. So um, patients that already have elevated, we would expect the potassium to come up some on an ACE inhibitor. And if a patient already has hyperkalemia, then we could push it um, even higher. Um, patients can experience a dry, like hacky cough. Um, so one of the things that uh, ACE, the enzyme ACE um, does is it breaks down um, something called bradykinin and there's a lot of that ACE enzyme in the lungs and so when you're not getting that breakdown of bradykinin in the lungs you end up increasing your chances of developing this kind of just irritating dry non-productive cough um, and then angioedema where patients can you know get like swelling of their lips their tongue um, and this can be life-threatening um, situation for patients. Um, also has to do with bradykinin and um, some other factors as well. But when you're stopping the breakdown of all of those factors, you can increase the patient's risk of developing angioedema. Um, from an ethnic standpoint, angioedema seems to be a higher risk for patients um, of African-American descent. Um, and then the dry, hacky cough seems to be more likely with patients of Asian descent, just when we look back at all the demographic data. Um, so just be aware of that. The other um, risk factor for angioedema, um, if you want to jot this down, is smoking. So if you have an African-American patient that is also smoking, um, it, it puts them at higher risk for angioedema. It's still not super common and, and definitely can be something that, um, you know, we still use in these patients. We just have to be a little bit more, um, weary of, of them developing that. So some of the, uh, drug interactions to be aware of, um, never use in patients that are taking so Cubitril, which we will talk about that drug. It's part of a brand name drug called Entresto. We'll talk about that when we get to heart failure. Um, so just kind of put that in the back burner for now. Um, it also can increase serum concentrations of lithium. So if a patient has, you know, bipolar disorder or some kind of other, like, um, they needed some kind of other, you know, situation where they need a mood stabilizer, um, you have to be aware of this because you can actually cause uh, lithium toxicity in those patients if you give it with an ACE inhibitor and you're not carefully monitoring the dose. Um, also giving uh, an ACE inhibitor with allopurinol, which is something that you can use for um, preventing a gout flare. Um, it can also increase your chances of having a reaction to the allopurinol. Um, and again, we'll kind of talk about that when we get to gout in more detail, but just kind of be aware that, that it does potentially interact with, with allopurinol. Um, you also have to be aware of a ACE inhibitor interacting with a medication that can also raise potassium. So the three that I always think about are 
SGLT2 inhibitors, which is a diabetes medication. Um, if you want to memorize just SGLT2s, we don't, I don't expect you guys to know um, the drugs in that class at this point, but you will in a few weeks. Um, also, spironolactone and aplerinone, which we're going to talk about later today. And then trimethoprim. Do you guys remember what brand name trimethoprim is? A, because it's a combination of trimethoprim and one other drug. Do you guys remember the brand name? Just so I feel like I'm not talking to myself. Bactrim, good, nice. All right, um, so I mentioned that it can cause an acute kidney injury. So one thing to, that you can kind of look out for when you start someone in an ACE inhibitor is you would get a baseline serum creatinine, so you can get like a, a CMP, and you can get their potassium and their sodium and all that, but also um, their serum creatinine will be in there as well. And whatever their baseline is, we're looking for an inc an, a bump of 30% from their baseline. So if a patient has, you know, serum creatinine of 1.2, we're looking for a 30% bump from 1.2. And if you have serum creatinine of 0.8, we're looking for a 30% bump from that. Uh, and that's kind of how we can judge whether or not they're having an acute kidney injury. Um, if we do expect the serum creatinine to go up some, I mean, 15, 20% can be normal, but having it go up 30% or more is when we start worrying about them having an injury and we would typically stop the ACE inhibitor. A lot of times patients, this kind of happens because the patient's dehydrated. And so, you know, there's some cases where you would just give the patient IV fluids, rehydrate them, and you could potentially um, retry an ACE inhibitor um, in some cases. And if you're just treating plain hypertension, there's plenty of other options we can go to as well if you weren't comfortable doing that. Um, but ACE inhibitors is a drug that we're going to use in a lot of different cardiovascular situations. So um, it's be aware of that, that just because a person has an AKI from an ACE inhibitor at one point doesn't mean we can never use it again. Um, the other thing is if a patient's baseline potassium is greater than 5.5, then we also don't want to start an ACE because then we're most likely going to push the patient into having hyperkalemia. So 1.5 uh, and lower is the is the cutoff. Um, you know, that's if you have a patient that's a five, even though that's kind of by most standards, 3.5 to five is kind of like considered normal potassium. Um, you still can, can give them an ACE inhibitor. It's 5.5 and higher is where we got to cut it off or higher than 5.5, I should say. Another kind of misconception that's out there, and I actually saw this recently on a like an older like pants study guide thing, um, is there used to be, and this was years and years ago, so I can't believe people are even still talking about it. Um, years ago, there was this idea that if you you could only have a certain baseline serum creatinine, and if it went up, if it was higher than that, then the patients were not eligible to be on an ACE inhibitor. It was contraindicated. Um, then this, there was a study that came out in 2006 um, that looked at benazapril in patients that had severe chronic kidney disease, so kind of like end-stage renal disease. Some of the patients in that study had serum creatinines all the way up to 5 milligrams per deciliter. So it was pretty pretty high. Those are patients, you know, stage 4 renal disease looking at getting on hemodialysis pretty soon. Um, and patients were given either benazapril, 10 milligrams twice a day, or placebo. And basically what they were looking at was the primary outcome, which was a composite of whether or not your serum creatinine doubled, um, the end-stage renal disease, which means you had to start hemodialysis, or death. So they were looking for those, those, one of those three things happening in either group. And the, when you com compile all the data, the, those things happening were significantly less risk in the patients that were on benazapril versus placebo. The number needed to treat was actually only five. So when that happened, they basically got rid of that recommendation that if a patient has a certain serum creatinine um, level at baseline, you can't give them an ACE. Um, and now the new like renal guidelines say it, whatever the patient's baseline is, that they can be on an ACE, and you're just looking for that 30% bump in their serum creatinine as far as a renal injury. But it doesn't mean that because it can cause that doesn't mean that you should not give one to a patient that has kidney disease. Does that make sense? I know that can be a little confusing. Anyone? Cool. Thank you, Mass. Appreciate it. Um, 
Okay, so again, I don't want you to think renal injury, C, CKD, and think I can't give an ACE inhibitor because I don't want to make their kidneys worse. It, it can help them. Um, as far as getting the most efficacy out of your ACE inhibitor, I'll use lisinopril as an example because this is something that is um, used probably more frequently than all the other ACE inhibitors, at least in my experience. Um, that's the one I typically see. Um, most patients are given lisinopril once daily. And if you even if you look back, let I me mean, go back to this initial page. If you look back at the, the way these are dosed, it says benazapril, and it can be once daily or twice daily. Um, Captopril can be twice daily or three times daily. So because there's like this kind of, you know, two different options you can dose the patient, um, lisinopril has always just kind of been once a day. I don't know why that became a thing, but the half-life of lisinopril is actually only 12 hours. So technically speaking, if we were going to dose on the half-life, which from a kinetic standpoint, a drug kinetic standpoint, that's what we should be doing, we would give lisinopril twice a day. The max dose is still 40 milligrams per day, but we should kind of split the dose. So if you have a patient that is on 40 milligrams of lisinopril per day, and they are still not controlled or not at goal where you want them at with their blood pressure before adding on another agent, you can potentially try splitting their dose, do 20 in the morning, 20 at night, and that can lower their blood pressure even more. Um, there's a study in 2017 that came out um, that showed um, basically th that this is true, that when you split the dose, you get further blood pressure lowering than if you give less than a pearl once a day. So over the last year and a half, two years or so, we're starting to see more and more um, clinicians dosing it this way. Um, not that once a day is wrong. I mean, if you can get to the blood pressure goal with once a day less than that's perfectly fine. Uh, but just be aware that if before adding on a second agent, you could potentially split the dose and see if that, that works. All right, any questions about ACE inhibitors? All right, so let's talk about the cousin to ACE inhibitors. That's the angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, or ARBs as they're called sometimes. So these are the list of the ARBs that are available on the market. Um, mechanism of action, um, they are blocking the angiotensin receptor, um, which is involved in the certain like vasoconstriction, aldosterone release, um, and, you know, constriction of the efferent arterioles or the glomerulus, multiple different pathways. Um, and actually, yeah, no, that's correct. Um, and so the, the other thing is there's receptors in the periphery, which um, can cause vasodilation, tissue repair, things like that. They do not block those receptors. Um, so they leave that part of it alone because we want that vasodilation and things like that. Um, and so we're really just blocking the negative effects of that angiotensin. Uh, and so the adverse effects are going to be similar to ACE inhibitors because they're still working on that same pathway. However, you're getting a lot less risk of angioedema as well as the cough. Because again, that cough is coming in the angioedema is coming from that breakdown of bradykinin and things like that. Um, this is just blocking the receptor. You're not actually blocking the enzyme ACE itself. And so you're still allowing ACE to break down that bradykinin. So those risks of those, those two things go down, um, pretty dramatically with, um, ARBs, even though we typically think of them kind of being the same class of medications. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so the, as far as which one is better, uh, there are, because for a long time, ACE inhibitors were considered like the gold standard. ARBs were like second line, if you will. And so the um, on-target trial came out, and that compared Ramipril, which is an ACE, versus Telmosartan, um, which is the ARB. And it actually looked at the combo as well, because um, that's an important thing, the combo. Um, some people try to use ACE and ARBs together, which is uh, not usually a good idea. Um, but basically, there was no difference between using Ramipril versus the Telmosartan. So it was one of the studies, one of the biggest studies that came out showing that there wasn't really a big difference between ACEs and ARBs from an outcome standpoint. Um, 
the combo had was also studied so ace and arb there was no additional benefit that they saw with using the combo and it actually led to a more substantial dropout of the study because of adverse effects so there is a few old school nephrologists that will try this sometimes where they give an ace and an arb together um, the majority of clinicians including all the guidelines say do not use an ace and arb together in almost all situations um, just because the benefit that you get from that is very little and the increases that you get in chances of having adverse effects go up tremendously so when i say ace arb i kind of just to count those as like the same class, if you will, um, just because I don't want it to be something that you think of those as being two separate classes that you can combine as first line treatment. So for now, I want you to always think ACE or ARB as kind of like one option. And then we'll talk about the other first line options that you can add to those. Um, there's another study that looked at uh, valsartan versus amlodipine, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, it's a calcium channel blocker. And um, again, saw no difference in primary outcomes, cardiovascular events, all that fun stuff. Um, there was a, a slight increased risk of having an MI with valsartan, um, but there's some speculation as far as why that kind of showed up with the way the, the patients were kind of um, broke down into the two groups and things like that. So um, typically speaking, you can pick, um, an ACE or ARB, um, or using one of the other first line options first line without having to really get any benefit from, or any additional benefit from any of any one agent. Um, we'll talk about a couple options or a couple of situations where that doesn't actually play out, but for the majority of patients, we kind of think ACE or ARB, either one would be fine for monotherapy. Any questions about ACEs or ARBs? Anything? All right. So uh, let's see. So is an ARB a good replacement for an ACE if the patient has a potassium? So same kind of thing with um, an ARB. If the potassium is over 5.5, you typically don't want to start it because it can increase the potassium as well. So all of the adverse effects, including like the chances for like acute renal disease, things like that, they all still are kind of at play with ARBs, except for the risk of cough and angioedema are significantly lower. Some people say they're not even risks, um, but that's going to be... Um, the other ones are going to be about the same as far as increasing your serum creatinine potentially and all that. Um, and then Lizzie's saying, uh, what are the most common ARBs? So the most common ARBs, let me go back to this slide here. Um, the ones that I personally see the most, uh, would be Losartan, Valsartan, and then probably Almosartan as well. Not that the other ones aren't used, but, Valsartan, Losartan, and Olmosartan are the three that I see the most. Uh, let's see, what else? Questions. Um, should an ARB be preferred since it doesn't cause cough or angioedema? So it depends on the guideline that you're looking at. Um, there's a lot more data that we have, like long-term data, showing like an increased risk of cardiovascular events, kidney protection, things like that with ACE inhibitors um, than ARBs. So a lot of the guidelines still do kind of recommend, recommend ACE inhibitors kind of first line, especially if the patients aren't necessarily at risk for angioedema. Angioedema is something that is a serious risk, but it's, it's one of those things that's not super super common. So, um, it's not like, I mean, we, I see patients on ACE inhibitors every single day. Um, and there's, it's not something in, I've seen angioedema very few times in just like an outpatient setting. Um, and so as far as like how to choose between the two, it really is going to be patient specific. You know, if the patient's had a cough on an ACE, then you can use, um, an ARB. If you have a patient that, um, if it has tried an ACE inhibitor, they didn't feel like it worked, they didn't like it, whatever, you could try an ARB. There's not like a great reason why we should be um, picking one over the other necessarily, other than the fact that ACE inhibitors have typically more data. Um, 
on a test, as far as like you picking um, a question on a test, I'm going to have it set up to be either an ACE or ARB. If, if one of those is the right answer, I'm not going to have an, like if an ARB that I'm looking for is the right answer, I'm not going to have ACE as an option. It'll be like the patient had side effects from the ACE inhibitor, you know, and then you could use an ARB if, if that was the case. But um, it doesn't mean that you, I'm not going to have it so you have to pick ACE or ARB necessarily, like where you have to choose. Um, Hannah is asking, so uh, African-American smoker that um, would be first line. So first line with African-Americans we're actually going to get to in a, in a little bit when we talk about calcium channel blockers, if you're dealing with monotherapy. Um, so hold that thought, Hannah. We'll get to that in a second. Um, Nikki says, uh, we shouldn't necessarily shy away. So we shouldn't necessarily shy away from prescribing Valsartan because of the value trial. Um, no, um, I wouldn't say that. And in fact, what's kind of weird is... There's another study that I didn't mention called Valiant, um, which looked at um, patients that had had a MI and they were put on uh, Valsartan or placebo after, and the patients that were on Valsartan had a decrease in recurrent MI uh, as the study went on. And so post-MI, Valsartan is actually one of the drugs that we have evidence to show that it decreases mortality. Um, The study that was looking at, the value trial was looking at... um, the Valsartan versus amlodipine. Um, there were some other factors kind of there as far as like the background um, characteristics, the baseline characteristics of the patients, things like that. So no, I wouldn't say that it's something you should necessarily shy away from, um, especially if the patient has other indications like chronic kidney disease, um, things like that, which we're going to get to in a little bit. Towards the end um, of this, and we, this is probably going to go into Thursday, but towards the end, we'll, we will uh, I have it step-by-step, step, kind of an algorithm to kind of follow um, that will help you differentiate when to use which agent. So right now, I don't want you to feel like if you're getting a little lost as far as when to use what, um, don't worry because we're going to come back around and put it all back together. I just want to make sure we get through the different classes first before we kind of lump everything together for the treatment. All right, let me pull up thiazide diuretics. So um, the four thiazide diuretics, or you'll see them either listed as thiazides or thiazide-like diuretics. Uh, the, the four that are available, hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothalidone, endapamide, and metolazone are the four that are available. Now, um, you're going to hear me say multiple times that I hate hydrochlorothiazide. Um, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and then metolazone is one that we typically only give to a patient who um, is on a loop diuretic for like diuresis. So like in heart failure patients and things like that. Um, and it gives like an added um, synergistic effect uh, for the diuresis when you add it to a loop. We don't, I've never personally seen metolazone used as just a standard hypertension medication. Uh, it's It's not one of the ones that we have great evidence for, uh, but it is technically a thiazide diuretic. And so, um, it's, I put it on the list, but the two that I personally recommend, and I'll explain why in a second are chlorthalidone or endapamide. Hydrochlorothiazide, which everybody and their brother is on, um, is a medication I don't like. And I'll explain why in a second. So thiazide diuretics, the mechanism of action um, is you're going to inhibit the sodium and chloride reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron. So you're you're inhibiting that sodium chloride reabsorption, so you're excreting it and getting rid of it, um, which then can also lead to other uh, electrolyte imbalances and things like that. But when you get rid of the sodium, um, your water kind of follows and uh, the patient's blood pressure ends up um, going down as a result. Um, However, typically we consider these to be not effective if the creatinine clearance is less than 30. So if you have a patient who's in end stage renal disease, their creatinine clearance is, you know, in the teens or twenties, um, thiazide diuretics are usually not the best option. Um, that being said, endapamide is one, and I think I have this in the next slide, but endapamide is one that you can potentially use. Um, and so the other ones though, like hydrochlorothiazide, which a lot, like I said, a lot of patients are taking, make sure you watch the renal function because once it goes below 30, you're losing all the benefits from the actual drug. <laughs> 
Um, adverse effects that are important to watch uh, and kind of be aware of is the electrolyte imbalances. And I was just quizzing my uh, fourth year PharmD students yesterday on this. So the things that we think about going decreasing are our potassium, so hypokalemia, um, magnesium, hypomagnesemia, um, as well as um, sodium, which I don't for some reason, I don't have that on here. So make sure you put a star and add that in there. You can get a um, hyponitremia as well, so decrease in sodium. So our sodium goes down, our potassium goes down, and our magnesium goes down um, with thiazide diuretics. Now, calcium actually goes up with the thiazide diuretic, which is different from other diuretics, and we'll talk about that later when we get to the other ones. That's what sets diazides apart from things like loops um, and other diuretics because one based on where they act but also calcium actually goes up with a thiazide diuretic versus down like in, in most others uric acid also can go up so if you have a patient that has a history of gout um, and so they have you know even if they're on like uric acid medication or uric acid excreting medications, um, if you put them on a thiazide diuretic there is a chance that they're going to get a spike in their concentrate their serum concentration of uric acid and they could have a gout flare so kind of be aware of that um increasing glucose reabsorption so if a patient has diabetes and you start the monothiazide you have to be aware that it could throw off their blood sugars for a little bit until they get them kind of back under control um but knowing which way the electrolytes kind of go is, is definitely important. So again decreasing potassium, decreasing magnesium, decreasing sodium and then increasing calcium, increasing uric acid, increasing glucose. Um, the other thing that you'll hear a lot is that patients should always take these in the morning if they're on a thiazide diuretic because it can cause like nocturnal diuresis and having to get up and use the restroom frequently. Um, I hear a lot of people saying like never take these at night. That nocturnal diuresis typically kind of goes away after a few weeks, um, especially once their blood pressure is controlled and their sodium content and all that is kind of under control. Uh, so that's not necessarily the case. I have several of my patients that take it a thiazide at night and do just fine. So that's like the textbook answer is like avoiding at you know nighttime administration. Um, but in real life, that doesn't always make that much of a difference. All right, so why I always hate on hydrochlorothiazide. Um, a couple things. So one, um, chlorothaldone and endapamide are the two that actually have cardiovascular outcome data. And so when I say outcome data, I'm talking about they've actually been shown to reduce the rate of cardiovascular mortality. They've been shown to reduce the rate of stroke or MI, um, whatever the case may be. They have big studies that have been done that show that and improve that. Hydrochlorothiazide has never had any of those studies. Um, and so from an outcome standpoint, we don't really know if a thiazide diuretic actually decreases the patient's chances of having a cardiovascular event just because those studies have never shown that. Um, and so for me, until we get data showing that HCTZ has the, which is the abbreviation for hydrochlorothiazide, um, until we get data showing that HCTZ is actually going to reduce the chances of a patient dying or having a heart attack or stroke, then it's not something that I typically recommend. Um, there was also a meta-analysis that was looking at just the blood pressure lowering effects of uh, clothaldone and endapamide, and we saw a um, 5 to 8 millimeters of mercury, respectively, so a little bit more blood pressure lowering with endapamide. Um, when you compare it to HCTZ. So if you have a patient that is, let's say, 138 over 80, and your goal is 130 over 80, just by switching them to endapamide instead of HCTZ could get them to goal by itself instead of adding another agent. So it gives better blood pressure lowering, and it actually has data showing that it decreases cardiovascular events, which is ultimately the most important concept. And we'll come back to that in, in a little bit. I can't remember where I have it in the slides, but we'll talk about treating numbers versus outcomes towards the end, I think. Um, 
And dapamide, the reason why it actually has even more blood pressure lowering than all the other agents in this class is because it actually, besides being a thiazide diuretic, um, has calcium channel blocking properties as well. So it can reduce some of the peripheral resistance um, as well. And so it has two different mechanisms that it's kind of working on. Um, the other good thing with endapamide is there are, is no renal dose adjustments um, necessary with this. So if a patient is, has a creatinine clearance of 15, you know, they're needing dialysis any second now, um, then you can still give them endapamide. You can use it with hemodialysis, and it doesn't have that less than 30 kind of um, contraindication with their serum creatinine. So if you have a patient with kidney disease, endapamide is definitely the way to go. Um, there was a study that proved that it decreased mortality in patients that were aged 80 to 100 years old. So that study called HiVet um, was one of the best outcome studies for endapamide. Uh, and so it showed that it, I mean, if you have a patient that's 85 taking endapamide, and in that study, they actually only used the 150 over 90 kind of um, standard blood pressure goal. And Endapamide, the patients that used endapamide to get to that goal had um, less chances of dying, even at that age, compared to patients that were taking placebo. So endapamide has data in, in very old patients. So that's kind of the other piece of that. If I have a patient with kidney disease or um, an el very elderly patient and I need a thiazide diuretic, endapamide is always kind of my go-to. You'd be really surprised. Um, most, I think a lot of clinicians that have that are a little bit older and stuff, especially have never even heard of, uh, endapamide. And they think it, they ask me if it's expensive, things like that. It's on the $4 list at Walmart. Um, it's just as cheap as HTTZ now. And yet a lot of times we just use HTTZ out of habit because that's the way we've always done things versus what does the actual data say? Um, now as of now, right now, there's actually a study happening at the VA where they are comparing chlorthalidone to HCTZ head-to-head -head, um, in a in an outcome study. So it's a randomized control trial, and if that comes out and the study shows that HCTZ has no difference in outcomes than chlorthalidone, then the guidelines will most likely kind of reshape how they recommend things. But as of now, they say you can use any thiazide diuretic, but they do recommend to get the most benefit for blood pressure lowering and, and outcomes to use what they call an evidence-based thiazide, which is chlorthalidone or endapamide. Um, Mark said, if there are CV da uh, outcome data comparing chlorthalidone or endapamide and an ACE, um, yes, which we will get to in a second. Um, chlorthalidone specifically to lisinopril. So we'll talk about that when we get to... Uh, I think I talk about that at the calcium channel um, blockers because they compared calcium channel blocker, thiazide, and an ACE to see if any of them were superior. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, so SHEP is a trial that showed that chlorothalidone can decrease um, mortality in, in uh, elderly patients. Um, they did like kind of like the secondary analysis of the data that was seen in SHEP, and what they found was that a, a patient whose potassium fell below 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. So, you know, that's the considered to have hypokalemia at that point. Um, they lost all benefit, all cardiovascular outcome benefit was gone with chlorth um, even though they were using chlorothalidone if the patient's potassium fell. So basically, if the pa patient's potassium stayed normal, then you, you saw the decrease in mortality and MI and stroke and all that. If it fell below 3.5, all those benefits were gone. It was like you'd never used an evidence-based thiazide to begin with. So if you ever see like a target potassium, um, some cardiologists will put out that they have a target potassium of 4 to 5. Um, that's where that's coming from. The reason why they say 4 to 5 is because if you can keep the potassium around 4, you don't even run the risk of going into the 3s and then going low. So they try to target 4 to 5 as like the potassium um, goal that they put if a patient's on a thiazide diuretic to get the most benefit and to ensure that those benefits kind of, uh, the outcome benefits are still in play. Um, the other thing is just to mention this, and I, I'll mention this again when we talk about heart failure, but... Loop diuretics are what we typically use for like true like diuresis for getting rid of fluid. Um, and we use this specifically in like heart failure and things like that. Um, 
sometimes you will see metolazone, which is really the only time you'll see that particular thiazide diuretic used, um, is when they add it to someone who's on a loop diuretic. So loop diuretics, um, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but loop diuretics work on the loop of Henle, on that part of the, the nephron. And so the loop of Henle, they, they block the reabsorption of sodium and all that. And what metolazone actually is doing is if you're not getting enough diuresis with the loop by itself, remember I said that most thiazide diuretics or the thiazide diuretics work on the distal convoluted tubule. Well, metolazone actually works on proximal and distal convoluted tubule. And so you get some blocking of the sodium um, ions in the proximal convoluted tubule, which shuttles more sodium down into the loop of Henle. And that allows for the loop diuretic to, to have a little bit more efficacy. Um, so those are used like as a synergistic um, combo, uh, but you typically would never see metolazone used just by itself in hypertension. So if you see that being used, they're most likely using it for diuresis and heart failure, um, not for regular hypertension. So all that being said, the moral of the story, if you're going to use a thiazide diuretic and you want my opinion on the matter, um, use chlorothiodone or indapamide. You're going to get the best results and um, typically have the best um, chances of decreasing that person's risk of having an event later on. Um, we've been switching a lot of our patients over to chlorothiodone over the last year, and we're, we're getting a little bit better um, handle on our hypertension patients. So um, just kind of food for thought there. Any questions on thiazide diuretics that you haven't asked already? All right. So um, let's talk through the next class, which is our calcium channel blockers. We have two separate um, versions of this class. We have the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, and then we have our non-dihydropyridine, which we'll talk about after this slide. Um, so our dihydropyridine are the ones that we're going to typically use in hypertension. Um, and this is going to be our amlodipines, our philodipines, things like that. Um, amlodipine is by far the number one agent in this class that you'll see. Um, philodipine, there's a lot more drug interactions to worry about. Um, the bioavailability is a lot lower. And so we typically don't see one of those options nearly as much anymore. Nifedipine, um, nicardipine, same kind of thing. We, they're available. Some patients are on them. But typically speaking, amlodipine is the one that we see. Um, as far as drug interactions to be aware of, the two big ones that I want you to be familiar with, um, the one that I see the most, that I kind of catch the most, I should say, is um, amlodipine and simvastatin. So simvastatin is our cholesterol medication, one of our statins. Um, amlodipine can increase the serum concentration of simvastatin. And so if you have a patient on amlodipine, you should not be using more than 20 milligrams of simvastatin. Um, when you are on 20 milligrams of simvastatin and you take amlodipine, it suddenly becomes like the patient is taking 80 milligrams of simvastatin, which even that dose is in most cases way too high. And you can increase the chances of the patient having like muscle cramps um, and even like rhabdomyolysis, which is a real serious ad adverse effect that can happen with statins. Um, and so this is something that I see a lot. I'll see patients on max dose amlodipine, and then they're on 40 milligrams of simvastatin, which means that they're getting basically 160 milligrams of simvastatin worth um, in their in their plasma concentration because of uh, the amlodipine inhibiting the breakdown of, of simva. Um, so if you're on amlodipine, should not be on any more than 20 milligrams of simvastatin, um, which when we get to lipids and stuff, we'll talk about. I'm not a huge fan of simvastatin anyway, but... Since it's still widely used, um, I want to make sure we at least mention that. Um, the other thing is fluconazole. So amlodipine um, can increase the, the fluconazole levels in the system. And so if a patient is on fluconazole um, and amlodipine, if it's one dose, you know, if they're taking one dose for a yeast infection and that's it, uh, it's not a big deal. You really would only worry about this if the patient needed to take like fluconazole for a period of time. Um, then we would we would worry about this interaction, but just know that it does interact. The mechanism um, of action kind of behind calcium channel blockers, and this is for the dihydropyridine, so like your amlodipine and your philodipines, um, 
your mechanism of action there is your your contraction of cardiac and smooth muscle, um, kind of blocking that calcium that they need in order to have that contraction. And so if you block those calcium channels, you block that influx of, of calcium, um, then you are eventually going to cause like this coronary and then peripheral vasodilation. And so normally when you get that contraction of muscle getting vasoconstriction, um, especially in the periphery. And so when you block those calcium channels, you're vasodilating and allowing that total peripheral resistance piece to kind of go down, which then can lower blood pressure. If you remember the equation, um, adverse effects. So hypotension, obviously dizziness, the big one that I always like make sure I warn patients about, or at least watch for is peripheral edema. So, Sometimes you'll see someone trying to fix peripheral edema that's coming from a calcium channel blocker with a loop diuretic or even a thiazide diuretic, which that makes even less sense. Um, because if you have swelling, you have fluid retention, then um, a loop diuretic works really well to get rid of that fluid. However, when you have peripheral edema from a calcium channel blocker, it's actually not coming from fluid retention. Um, what happens is your kind of post capillary bed gets dilated. Um, so your arterial side gets dilated and you get this inf inflow of, uh, or influx of, of blood flow into the capillaries, which causes capillaries to swell. Um, but you don't get to dilate the post capillary bed or the venous side of things. And so when that happens, you you get this swelling of capillary, intracapillary pressure goes up, you get this swelling of the capillaries, which that's what's actually causing the edema. It's not fluid being held onto, it's actually the, the capillaries swelling with blood, and that's what's causing the um, peripheral edema when it's a calcium channel blocker at the you know root of it. Um, so in order to actually get rid of peripheral edema from a calcium channel blocker, you have to combine it uh, with an ACE inhibitor. So an ACE inhibitor will dilate the post-capillary bed, the venous side, and allow that intracapillary pressure to go back down. The capillaries aren't, aren't swollen anymore, and then everything kind of flows normally again. So if you have a patient that's swelling, um, you put them on amlodipine, they start having peripheral edema a couple, you know, by the month follow-up. Um, don't try to give them a loop diuretic to get rid of it. It will not work. You'll basically just get rid of their electrolytes for no reason. So ACE inhibitor is what you have to use in order to get rid of peripheral edema. That's something that I've seen a lot of people not be aware of. So I make sure that I mention it. All right. Um, so I'll finish up these last couple slides. Um, so uh, Mark was asking about um, a trial that compared like an ACE inhibitor to a thiazide. Um, so there's a really big study, one of the most quoted like cardiology hypertension studies that you'll see is called All Hat. All Hat was there was four treatment groups in All Hat. There was amlodipine, there was lisinopril, there was chlorothaladone, and there was doxazosin, which we haven't talked about doxazosin yet. Um, the doxazosin arm was stopped prematurely because they saw an increased risk in congestive heart failure um, compared to chlorothaladone specifically. So they stopped that study um, or stopped that arm of the study and then just continued on with amlodipine, lisinopril, and chlorothaladone. So those are the three that we always talk about with All Hat. Doxazosin, which I'm not a fan of at all, um, is I, I when I first got to the, my job now at Fetter Healthcare, um, I literally saw so many people on doxazosin. I'd never seen that many patients on doxazosin before, and I, I couldn't figure out why. Um, and so I showed them this study and a couple others that showed how garbage doxazosin is and we started switching patients off that so just be aware that they've they've this is one of the studies that shows that doxazosin is trash um, but amlodipine lisinopril chlorothaladone the primary outcome where they were looking at some sort of a fatal coronary artery disease um, which could be mi um, could be unstable angina all that stuff um, there was no difference in any of the three groups, um, no difference in non-fatal MI. Um, the only thing that they saw that was statistically different was amlodipine was superior to lisinopril for actual blood pressure control. So not necessarily outcomes, but actually controlling the blood pressure in African-American patients. And it did lead to a decreased risk of stroke specifically in women um, when you compared it to an ACE inhibitor. So... Typically speaking, 
we can use, if you have a patient that you need to put on monotherapy for hypertension, you can use any of the three first line options. So you can use an ACE, ACE or ARB, you can use a thiazide, or you can use amlodipine. Now, if a patient is African American, um, typically amlodipine is going to be a better option as far as the actual lowering of their blood pressure um, if you're going to use monotherapy. Now, if you're using combination, things like that, it, it's not as big of a deal. But I do typically, if I have an African American population, which that's the majority of patients that I see are African American, um, I use amlodipine by if I'm using an agent by itself. Um, another question that'll come up is um, amlodipine and diabetes, because um, for a long time, if a patient had diabetes and they needed blood pressure control, we automatically put them on an ACE inhibitor. Um, ACE inhibitors can protect the kidneys. Um, and so if a patient has diabetes, one of the long-term risks of that is um, increase in nephropathy and, and kidney damage. And so we would automatically put them on an ACE inhibitor regardless of what their kidney function was doing, whether they had proteinuria or anything like that, um, because we thought that that would reduce their risk of having kidney issues. Um, that being said, now with more data that's come out, they still say the same thing. If you have uh, an African-American patient that has diabetes, you can use amlodipine in those patients as long as they don't have kidney disease. If they have kidney disease, then we still use an ACE inhibitor in those patients. Um, and again, we're going to double back to this, but I want you to kind of be see some of the different comorbidities that come up with, um, you'll see in hypertension patients. Cause usually if a patient has hypertension, they also have something else going on. So this is something that, um, is important to think about. And the reason why I said if a patient has diabetes and they have, um, kidney disease and sp specifically if they're spilling protein, we want to use a ACE inhibitor in those patients instead of amlodipine, regardless of race, um, is because, with amlodipine um, or calcium channel blockers in general, you get this dilation of the afferent arterial and the nephron. So if you can see my mouse, you get this dilation of the afferent arterial, which increases blood flow into the glomerulus, um, increasing intraglomerular pressure, which then, in, unless the efferent arterial is also dilated, um, that intraglomerular pressure continues to go up, and you have an increased chance of spilling protein down into the nephron and eventually causing proteinuria. So you can actually cause like damage to the patient's um, kidneys if the patient already has proteinuria and you give amlodipine by itself um, without an ACE inhibitor, then you can actually cause a problem. And this is something that I actually had one of, uh, he's graduated now, but one of the guys from the first class at the PA school, um, he, he actually was at, uh, doing his OB rotation at Fetter and he, he came and got me one day and he said, uh, he's like, I want to make sure I'm understanding this right. Cause he showed me the patient's labs and the patient had uh, proteinuria. They, some re de decreased renal function. They also had diabetes, but they needed blood pressure control at that point. And so they had been put on amlodipine at the previous visit and it didn't flag in the system. There was no like drug interaction or disease state interaction. And when we checked the proteinuria again, it had gotten worse and the patient was still only on amlodipine. And he actually caught it and it was the one that was able to start an ACE inhibitor. And the, at the follow-up visit, the patient's proteinuria had actually decreased um, and their kidneys were, you know, a little bit better protected um, because he found that. So if he hadn't been familiar with that kind of physiology going on, then and the mechanism of action that would have because the person he was working with his preceptor actually overlooked it and didn't realize that was a, a thing. So he came and got me to make sure he was thinking about it right, which he was spot on and able to, was able to help the patient. So I know that's a lot of information as far as the physiology happening there, but it is something that's important to kind of pay attention. Um, so Kathleen's asking, so do you use an ACE inhibitor or both? If you need two different drugs and you have a patient that has diabetes, kidney disease, things like that, then you can use, um, and it's specifically the ones that have the kidney disease along with their diabetes. Then you can, you can use an ACE inhibitor in those patients, or if you need two different medications, you can use amlodipine, but just make sure you use an ACE inhibitor with it. Now, if the patient has no kidney disease whatsoever, their kidneys are perfectly healthy, they have diabetes, um, then you can use either amlodipine or an ACE inhibitor or a thiazide. It doesn't really matter. It's when the patient has kidney disease as well as diabetes that you want to 
kind of start thinking about this process. This happened. Um, I saw another patient that this kind of was taking place on uh, last Friday as well. The patient had really bad proteinuria, was only on amlodipine, and wasn't on an, on an ACE inhibitor. So we got them started on an ACE inhibitor to kind of protect those those kidneys um, because again the, the ACE is going to dilate the afferent and the efferent and decrease that intraglomerular pressure kind of the same way that it works when you have peripheral edema from the calcium channel blocker all right I guess it's 12 30 already I did not realize the time had gone by so I'll stop there um, I know that's a lot do you guys have questions at all for me on that stuff